Good morning, friends. Smile at me for a moment. Thank you so much. It's been interesting listening to the songs that have come this morning and the thrust of many of the songs. How many of them were about the bride of Christ and how many of them were about us looking forward to that day when Jesus returns? And I think in the church generally, across the nations, there's a growing desire and a longing and a calling out to God, even so, Jesus, come quickly. I don't know if you sense that, but I feel that. Uh, maybe it's because we turn our TV sets on and see all the terrible things that take place. And there's something saying, oh God, it shouldn't be like this. You made such a glorious, magnificent, splendid earth. And look at the mess that it's in. And only Jesus can change it. Even so, Lord, come quickly. The bride cries out, come quickly. The bride is looking forward to the wedding. This is a strange picture, I think, for people new into Christian things about the bride and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, the bride of Christ, which is the church, crying out, crying out. You know, the Word of God says this about the marriage of the Lamb. It says, the bride has made herself ready. It's not that Jesus somehow comes along and fixes you up and makes you ready but we have a part to play in making ourselves ready for the coming of the king. The bride, are you all right? <laughs> you having a moment? <laughs> but the bride herself is making herself ready. We have a part to play in the coming of the king. In fact, I think it's in, in Peter um, where it writes, what manner of people ought we to be as we look forward to that coming and hasten its day. We can, by the way that we live our lives, the way that we conduct ourselves, the manner of people that we are, hasten the coming of the King. And I suppose if you look at it that way, we can also delay the coming of the King if we're not being responsive. His return is not circled around a date on the calendar of heaven. Oh, yes, got to remember that day. That's when I'm coming again. No, no, his day, his timing is determined by the beating of your heart and my heart. And when we say, yes, Jesus, yes, Jesus, and we sing, whatever you want, Lord, it's for you. I've said it before, Christians don't tell lies, they just sing them. <laughs> well, I'm sure they're not lies. I'm sure you mean every word of it because you're the best people in the world because you're the people of God. Isn't that right? Uh, so this morning, um, if you have your notebooks all poised and your pens sharp and, and you're dying to get down lots of pearls of wisdom, just put them away. It ain't <laughs> because really I don't want to touch your minds or your notebooks. I just want to touch your hearts. I, I just want to touch your heart because if there's one thing that I love and God loves, it's the bride of Christ, it's the church. And the church of Jesus is a wonderful, magnificent, glorious, splendid thing. You look out across Christendom and you think, well, I might have some questions about that. But I want you to know that the kind of church that God gave his life for, the kind of bride that Jesus laid down his life for, is truly magnificent. Good. I'm glad we, us two people, agreed to that. I want to read a passage of Scripture to you. This passage of Scripture uh, is the first occurrence where the, the word house of God appears in the Bible. And when a, a verse or, or something appears for the first time in the Bible, theologians put great store in what takes place there because it sets a pattern for what that word means. And of course, the house of God in the New Testament, in our lives, is a church. It's a house of God. We are the house of God. We are the family of God. We are the people of God. And so this explains what God is kind of looking for as I read it to you. It's in Genesis chapter 28. It tells the story of Jacob, who's on the run from his brother, who he's just conned out of his birthright, and he's having to run away. Uh, and Genesis 28 
verse 10 in the New International Version. There we go. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Hermon. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. That's a good verse, isn't it, by the way? God won't leave you till he's fulfilled his promise to you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is a gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, so that I return safely to my father's house. Then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I, that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Here's the first mention of the house of God in the Bible. And here's a picture of how God wants to see his house. These are things that we can draw out of this. Um, I'm not going to be spending much time on this, but I just think it's important that we understand that the house of God is awesome. It's okay. <laughs> we'll get there before the morning's up. <laughs> In fact, I'm not going to go home till I do. <laughs> Here is the house of God. This is a place where Jacob encountered the presence of God. Here is a place that heaven and earth became connected. Here's a place that had a stairway in it. God does not live in a bungalow. Okay? God lives in a house. It's not semi-detached either. Connected to the world and, uh, in that sense. Uh, he doesn't live in a bungalow with a staircase. If you ever go into a place and there's no staircase, if you ever go to a church and there's no staircase, it's not the house of God. Well, what do you mean by that? You know, there's a fascinating verse in John, uh, John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 50-ish. You keep moving it. But you know. uh, and he's talking to a man called Nathaniel. He meets his guy called Nathaniel, and Nathaniel is incredibly impressed because Jesus brings this word of knowledge to him. He says, wow, that's fantastic. And Jesus says to him, you're going to see greater things than this. You're going to see much greater than this. In fact, you will see the Son of Man, an angel. I'm going to, okay, look, so I'll get it right. Let me look, look this up somewhere. Yeah. I wrote it down. I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Can you get that right at the very beginning when Jacob has this vision, he sees a staircase with angels ascending and descending. He's seeing Jesus. He's seeing Jesus in the house. Never go into a church which is a bungalow because if it's not got a staircase called Jesus and he's central, that ain't the house of God. Because in the house of God, Jesus is central. 
Jesus is around everything. It's fantastic. Here's a place where there's a connection between heaven and earth. Here's a place where angels are ascending and descending. Here's a place of angelic manifestation. This is the house of God. It's a place where divine promises were being made. God's promising him things. It's a place where God was speaking to men. I was made of what a great prophetic word this morning through David in that song. Presence of God came in the room. And Ali's response. I just love that. That's church. You know why? God speaking. God speaking. It was a place anointed with oil. It says that um, Jacob poured oil on the pillar. It was a place, by the way, to which the tithe was brought, the 10% was brought. I'm not going to get into that message this morning. Relax. But there was a place where the tithe was brought. This is the first mention of the house of God, the church, in the Bible. It's really important that we understand that his house, and Jacob declared it to be, this is an awesome place. Surely God is here. We see here the first picture of the house of God, and it was declared to be an awesome place. Here's a word that's been downgraded, isn't it? Awesome. That used to mean something, awesome. You see somebody now, they've got some KB. I love that. new trainers. Awesome. No, they're not. They're quite nice trainers. Okay, KB, but they're not awesome. They're not awesome. You know, new haircut. Awesome. <laughs> no, he's a nice haircut. She looks fantastic, but he's not awesome. God is awesome. Awesome takes your breath away. I, I remember the first, I was in Africa, I think it was Zambia, I'm not quite sure. Uh, and, and I looked up first to see a, a sky that had not been polluted by light. You know what I mean? And the first, has anybody seen that? And you look up and you can see galaxies. What did you do? You went, oh, it took your breath away. It took your breath. That's awesome. Sorry, but your breath, no, your trainers don't take my breath away, unless you take them off, maybe. You, you, go, to the, you go to the Grand Canyon, <laughs> you go to the Grand Canyon, you expect to see a big hole in the ground, and you go there, and you see this thing three mile wide, mile deep, and you go, ah, it's awesome. Do you know, God is awesome. He takes your breath away. It's just that we never see him. Oh, if we could just have the, uh, the word John brought about the taking our eyes off and just seeing something uh, of the magnificence of God. To see the invisible. To see God. Oh, man. We, if you can see God, you can't just take churches. Oh, yeah, we'll turn up and sit down. And, oh, God is an awesome God. He takes your breath away. If you've ever been in a gathering or a meeting where God has truly been moved, I know many of you have. When you've heard angels singing, when you've seen cripples getting out of wheelchairs, and you think you jump up and down and sing, and isn't that far? no, all you can do is go, oh, God is here. And it takes your breath away. It takes your breath away. And I want to be part of a community of people that when we gather, it takes our breath away. I don't want to just do church as normal and, and, and average. God's better than average. He takes our breath away. He's glorious. He's magnificent. He's outstanding. I want it when we come together, the presence of God so fills this place that we can't move because of the presence of God. I want it to be that there's miracles and signs and wonders, prophetic word, God speaking, words of knowledge, words of wisdom. The place is electric with the presence of God. For our God is an awesome God. And I don't want us just to take church average. I want it to be magnificent. We have to raise the temperature. You know, Jacob did not realize how awesome that place was till he woke up. And declared, how awesome is this place. 
And folks, we need to raise from our slumber, raise from our sleep, rise from our lethargy and say, God, I want this place to be filled with your awesome presence. Do you? I mean, is that how you want it to be? I love you. Oh, God, I love you. You're the best people in the world. And I want the best for us. I want it to be awesome. And God's got a grand design. You know that program on TV, Grand Designs? I like that program. Somebody wants a house built, a couple want a house built. They have this wonderful dream of this wonderful house. And uh, Kevin McLeod goes and he tells them what he wants built. And he shows them the pattern. He shows them what he wants building. And then the builders come on site. And the architects come and they start building. And then the rest of the program is all about all the hardships and, and difficulties and problems that they encounter. You've seen the show, haven't you? And then at the end, despite all those problems, the house is completed. Mr. and Mrs. whoever are now in the house. And Kevin knocks on the door. And it's awesome. And they're so happy. They're so pleased. And I'm watching the show. And Pam Pats passes me the Kleenex because I'm crying. He's got the house. Do you know, God's got a design for his house. And it's a grand design. And he does not want to build something which is rickety and average and falling down. His house will be a magnificent house. And he's waiting for the bride to make herself ready. He's waiting for you and he's waiting for me to play our part to make the bride ready. Our God is an awesome God and he has a grand design for his house. And he's inviting you and he's inviting me to be part of what I heard you sing. We will, Lord. What was the song, Valley? We will, Lord. Well, it doesn't matter what the words were. Hey, we will. Yes, I'm going to be part. The danger is you get up and go, I'm going home oh, now. Telly. I'm back to normal. My friends, we're better than that because we belong to an awesome God. We belong. We just talk so much about so many aspects of the kind of house that God is looking for. But I just want in the three hours I have left... <laughs> I just want in the time, I just want to pick up on one thing and about how it is when we come together. Now, most of the hours of my life are not here. It's out there doing the stuff. Coming in here is not the stuff. Out there is doing the stuff. Coming in here is preparing you to go out there and do the stuff. You ever played, have you ever watched American football? No, okay. That's a strange old game. Most of the game, they're just talking to one another. They get into what they call the huddle. Have you seen that? Like a scrum, but they don't. And they get into the huddle and they talk about what they're going to do. And I don't know what they do, but they say, oh, you pass to him. And he runs up there. And he runs four, eight, like that. Okay. But then they all get into position and then they start shouting numbers and go. And everybody starts running all over the place. Eight, four, two, one. Throws the ball and catches it. See, the huddle isn't the game. The huddle is to prepare you and equip you to go out and do the stuff. The huddle here is not the game. We're here to get prepared to go out there and do the stuff. This isn't the game. We think, oh, I go to church. That's the game. This isn't the game. We come here for this one purpose, listen, to worship God, to encounter him. That's it. We come to worship him, to encounter him, and to allow him, as we worship him, to equip us to go out there and do the stuff, to play the game. Isn't that right? So I just want to talk briefly about coming together and give you some thoughts on that. How long have we got, Ali? Quarter of an hour? Listen quick. I'll talk quick, you'll need to listen quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 26 is a great verse because it kind of summarizes much of what we want to say. It should appear on the screen above me. And this is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And he's talking about what should happen when the church gathers. And he says, what shall we say then, brothers and sisters, in that, by the way, when you come together, 
Say the word. No, not that, that next word. E oh, did I say each? Oh, my version says, everyone, myself, everyone. Well, each, same word. Each or everyone has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. All of these things might be done, could be done, should be done, must be done. All these things must be done. That's what happens when we come together. Every one of us nudge the person next to you and say, he's talking about you right now. No, seriously, I'm talking about that person right now. Every one of you. Every one. You. Okay. You. I'm talking to you. Don't say, oh, next door, they need to hear this word. I'm talking to you right now. Are you listening, Gene? You. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Every one of us is responsible. You've not come to a show. Dave and the musician, you've not come to a show. You've come to the family of God. You've come to the people of God. You've come to be part and to give as well as to receive. Yeah? Not a one-man band stood at the front doing everything. It's a family. It's a body of Christ. It's a priesthood of all believers. And you're a priest if you belong to Jesus. You're part of that priesthood of all believers. And it gives a list of things that should take place. A, a hymn, a revelation, a, a tongue, an interpreter. This is not meant to be a definitive list, an exhaustive list, list of the kind of things that happen. It's just to say, when you come together, there should be manifestations of the Holy Spirit moving in your midst in all kinds of different ways. That makes life exciting. I find that when I'm flowing in the Holy Spirit, life gets a bit more exciting. Because I don't even know what he's going to do next. You know, you come on a Sunday morning. What camera's on? Can I go over there? I, I disappear sometimes. Some people think, I'll stay here. Some people think that's a good idea, by the way, for me to disappear. But what was I talking about, Dave? Oh, yeah, I'll tell you where I was. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, yes. Ah. <laughs> Not like Frankie Howard. <laughs> we have no idea what's going to happen on a Sunday morning. We don't have the hymns all listed out on the wall. That's what we're going to. We haven't got a clue what's going to happen. We probably know the opening song, have a, an idea of one or two songs that we might sing. But if God comes and God breaks in, let's forget everything. In fact, we do get a little bit locked into time of worship, notices, offer, da, da, da. Somebody gets up and speaks, 12 o'clock, go home, have your dinner. That was Sunday. You know, it works because it's, it's nice to have a framework so God can break in. Yeah? We have a framework so God can break in. That, that, that's why we have a framework. Okay. But, but all these things... It should be like a, a banquet laid out on a Sunday with all kinds of wonderful things for us to enjoy. It should be like some kind of Holy Ghost smorgasbord of, of delight that when we come together, we don't know what's going to happen, but God's in our midst and all kinds of things are taking place. All these things, it says, must be done for the strengthening of the church. These things happen to strengthen you and to equip you to go out there and do the stuff. But we don't do those things. People don't go out and do the stuff. There has to be Holy Spirit dimensions in all of our meetings. And not just from these guys at the front. From you. Nudge the person next to you and say, from you. The, the, you know, Paul goes in, into a place called Ephesus, a city called Ephesus, and he meets some disciples, and he's with them in this sort of meeting that they're having. And um, after a minute or two, he says, can I just ask you a question? He says, what? He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He didn't doubt they believed. He just said, where's the Holy Ghost dimension in this? 
There's no sense of the Holy Ghost here. What's going on? We didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. I used to go to that church. That's a bad joke. So edit that out. <laughs> you didn't even know what... Well, whose name were you baptized into then? Into John's baptism. Oh, you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus. So these people all get baptized in the name of Jesus. They come out of the water... Paul lays his hands on them. They're filled with the Holy Spirit, start speaking in tongues and prophesying. He says, that's better. Now let's get on with the meeting. With the Holy Ghost dimension now. See, every gathering we have has to have Holy Spirit dimensions or that we're not communicating with God because when we communicate with God, it's got to be by the Holy Spirit. Do we agree? I'm glad. Singing a hymn. or chorus, or whatever, is more than just having a communal sing-along. As we worship, our voices become a vehicle that engages heaven. It rises like, a, like an incense to the throne room of God. Because he, you were talking about it this morning, Ali, in your prayer, he is the focus of our gathering. He and he alone is the focus of our gathering. We don't come here to sort your needs out. We don't come here to get your problems sorted out. We come here to love God. The great tragedy can be, at the beginning of our meeting, we start singing a song. Somebody gets up and says, I just want you to know that, you know, there's some of you here in need today. And, no, no, get your eyes off people's needs. Let's focus on Jesus. And as we focus on Jesus, what you're going to find is this. He'll meet your needs. He knows how many hairs on your head. He knows everything about you. He knows every need that you've got. And so if you just focus on him and love him and worship him, he knows our needs. But when we have our focus on ourselves, we're no longer focusing on him. That's a terrible thing. We're here to worship God. He's the focus of everything. Don't let the meeting get hijacked into your, into your needs. We'll never, we'll never touch heaven if we are me orientated, And as we engage heaven, God by his spirit comes and speaks to us. He imparts his love and his strength and his power and, and his peace. Angels crowd in to see the church, the glorious bride. Do you know right now, right now, this place is surrounded by angelic hosts. We don't see it with our natural eye, but if we could unveil, as John said when he was speaking the other, if we could lift that veil from our eyes, this place is surrounded by angelic uh, hosts, looking in to see the manifest wisdom of God being displayed through the church. That's what the Word of God says. Isn't that fantastic? There's angels looking at you right now. You're not paranoid. People are watching you. Awesome. I want you to know, Glenn, you're right. Awesome. God is awesome. This place is surrounded by our angels ascending and descending, ministering spirits, a God in the midst, the presence of God here, the Holy Spirit here. Our God is an awesome God. And he wants you to be connected, that when you walk in, it's not just Sunday as normal, but when you walk in, it's into the very presence, the very throne room of God. Our worship must be in spirit and in truth. Our worship must be in spirit and in truth. Jesus said, the time is coming and is already here when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for anyone who will worship him that way. It's not just singing a song. It's engaging my spirit with God. That's what makes the difference between singing and worshipping, the engaging of my spirit. It's like when I speak in tongues, I'm not just babbling to the air. I'm engaging God. The one who speaks in tongues speaks mysteries to God. It's not I'm just going, No, it's And I'm engaging with God. I'm touching the throne room of God. My mind might not be fruitful in what I'm saying, but my spirit is, and I'm gauging my whole being in touching heaven. Amen? Time is coming, and he's already here. 5 to 12. The time is already here. 
when true worshippers, hello, true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And the Father is looking or searching for anyone who will worship him that way. Oh, it's Sunday morning. The Father, and the Father is looking. The musicians start to play. The Father is looking. People wander in. The Father is looking. Words go up on the screen. The Father is looking. People begin to sing. The Father is looking. Right now, right now, the Father is looking. Looking down the roads. Up and down. Is this one? Is, it, uh, is this one? Is, is this one? Oh, here's one. Here's one. Here's one. They're in spirit and in truth. They're engaging me. Is, is this one? Is, is this going up down the roads? Is this one? He's looking and he's searching for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Don't be hard to find. Don't be hard to find. Saul in the Old Testament was anointed king by Samuel. And then sometime later they're going to pronounce him king and set him before the people. This was his moment to stand. This is his moment to stand before the people. And they gather all the people around. And they say, well, well, well where, where's Saul? Where, where's Saul gone? We can't find Saul. At the moment we need Saul. And Where's Saul? And they go looking for him and they find him hiding in the baggage. You know the story. They find him hiding in the baggage. Some of you are hiding in the baggage. And you need to come out and stand up and be what God's called you and anointed you to be. Yes? We want to raise the temperature of our gatherings. Let me give you some ideas. Okay? I want to go through these really quickly. <laughs> Hopefully. First, come. Be here. Come. What, what camera's on? That one? No. Camera, okay. It's time you left your couch and came here. We miss seeing you. You can't function and minister as part of the body of Christ from your sofa. You need to be in the house. God bless you. We love you. Turn around, look at that camera and say, we love you. And we miss you. And get yourself in here. <laughs> Come. Let's, can the next one? Come early. If the musicians have already started and we're leading in worship and people are drifting in, that's a harder job for the musicians and singers, the worship leaders. Come and come on it. What Eliza do little? Get me to the church on time. Not hard, just leave. I know sometimes kids are sick in your shoe or whatever it happens. Yeah, clean the shoe, get it, come late. That's all right. Get here early if you can. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Don't try to come in here to get cheered up. Come full of thanksgiving and praise. Yeah? In the Bible, he talks about the song of ascents, the songs that they used to sing on the way to worship God. On the way, yeah? Maybe you should turn off gold radio or we should put something else on. <laughs> we tend to just listen to rock and roll music. It makes us happy when we get here. <laughs> Come to the Mary seminar. We've learned so much in 50 years. We really have, haven't we? I'm happily married. I asked Pam, she told me I was. <laughs> be responsive. In the gathering, be responsive. Don't sit like they're like a dummy. Do you know how you got saved? You believed in your heart and you confessed with your lips. And it was the confessing of your lips that brought you into salvation. It's time the people of God were more oral, more vocal, more outspoken. Yes? Amen? Pardon? That's right. You just let your yak, let you say it out. 
Do you know that when somebody says something, a great truth, and you say amen, a little angel comes and he's got a hammer and a golden nail and he nails that truth to your heart. Did you not know that? I'm sure it's in the Bible somewhere. I might have made it up. but <laughs> Amen helps. Amen. Amen. Stop now. <laughs> be responsive. Be prayerful during the week about... God, have you got something that I can take? Are you saying something to me that I can take to the family of God this week? A prophetic word, anything, God, what, what have you got me? So I can take something. Yeah? A, a testimony of what God has done in your life that week. God did this, God did that, God did the other. And when you've given your testimony, don't make it two hours long. I don't need to know that it was raining and you had the dog with you. Just tell me the guts of it and that God did this. Make sure at the end of it, God gets the glory and not you. It's about God and not about you. I don't want to be getting drawn closer to you by your testimony. I want to get drawn closer to God. Respond to the worship leader. They're not there as religious cheerleaders. Yeah? Let them lead us together into his presence. Be responsive to them. They work so hard, Dave. Ali, the whole team, they work so hard at preparing. They really, really do. Be responsive to them. You know, do you know you won't like every song that they sing? There's some songs they sing, I don't really like this song too much. Yeah, don't complain and get old. Get over it, for goodness sake. Grow up. Go, just love God. Love Jesus. Sing the song anyway. Yeah. Hello. It's not the time for your quiet time when you come on Sunday morning, by the way. You're not going to sit there and have your little quiet time. I know people, and they come, and they're all singing, and they're just sat there quietly having their quiet time. Have your quiet time at home. Yeah? This is a time that we're corporately gathering to worship God. Yeah? We're, this is a great church with, with warmth and love and friendship and, and, and honouring and respect of one another. I love that about this church. We are a family of friends. Smile at me when you say that. that is, <laughs> we're a family of friends. Do you know that's a great thing? Because when somebody gets up, they're going to receive you so positively. They're going to just say, yes, that's wonderful. Praise God. It doesn't matter how stumbling how you are about it. They're going to love it because they love you. Yeah? That's a great thing, you know. Somebody once said, you can't grow bananas in the Arctic. I don't know why they said that. No, they, said, they said, you can't grow bananas in the Arctic. You have to have the right climate and environment in order for them to grow. And you know, that's the same here. You can grow here because you're loved and valued and accepted. Be sensitive in the meeting to what's taking place. Hello? Stay with what's the flow of the meeting. You know, in every gathering, there's a golden thread going somewhere. God's taking us somewhere. And we need to be sensitive to that. Again, don't hijack meetings and take the meeting off in a tangent. Be sensitive for the worship leader. Yeah? There's nothing harder for the worship leader than to have to try and rescue the meeting because somebody's... <laughs> I, I, I. if the meeting is high praise we don't want to start a story halfway through it we want to stay where we are hello stay where, yeah be safe I love people who are Welsh I like Welsh people no I do I like Welsh people especially from the valleys because no matter what they say it makes you happy we're all going to die. Oh, good. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm so pleased. <laughs> See, they're up there. See, no disrespect to people from the black country, but I was going to die and Jesus saved me. I'm depressed. <laughs> I don't know what he did. See, just be in tune with what's taking place in the meeting. Hello? Hello? <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Just, it's either just, please just be sensitive to what's taking place. Leaders are there to bring security into a gathering so that you know that if anything goes awry, there's somebody there who's going to sort it out. You don't have to. We are there to bring a security into a meeting. We are there to, to maintain a direction in the meeting. Yeah? Don't hijack meetings. If you have a prophetic word and you get up and bring the prophetic word, and this is what God said, uh, now I want you to all sit down, and, and you've just taken the meeting away from the leaders. That's not your place. The, the leaders make those kind of decisions. We're just giving what God has given to us. And the leaders maintain the direction. Okay? And bring correction if necessary. If you bring a prophetic word and it's, or a supposedly prophetic word and it's way out of line, then we might tell you, say something in a lovely, loving, kind, sweet way. Here's the last thing just get out of the boat. Get out of the boat. You've never got out of the boat. Do you know what I mean by that? I'm going to step out right now. Has anybody ever stepped out of the boat and messed it up? Apart from me. Please. John Sutton Smith has his hand up. David Rayner. Yeah. Dave Gregg nearly did. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. To be honest, to be honest, he thought he made a mistake once and he hadn't. <laughs> we all mess it up because we're not... We, we, we see in part, we prophesy in part. We're, we're all on the, on the learning curve. And you know what? I bet none of those things sunk the boat. Sunk the boat. No, I didn't. I want to encourage you. This, this is what I want to encourage you when you come, to come stirred in the spirit. I want you to come with a sense of our God is an awesome God, and this day he might use me. I want you to come ready and prepared in your heart. I want you to enter with thanksgiving. I want this place to be so full of such a passionate people of God that everything changes around us. I love what God's doing amongst us. We are deeply grateful for everything, but when you've seen more, you long for that all the time. You know, so step out of the boat. The devil always wants to say to you, is this me? Yeah. Has anybody had a word to bring in a meeting and not brought it and then afterwards said, I wish I'd brought that word? Can you put your hand right up if that's ever been the case? Right up. I wish I'd said. I wish I'd done. Yeah. Look around. Yeah. And you know what? Every time, you didn't. It, you, we missed something that would have reinforced what was God was saying into the gathering. Be brave. Step out of the boat. If we don't, I don't stand there to be some kind of bouncer when contributions come. Just, is this in line with what we feel God's doing right now? That's all it is. God is with us. We're in exciting times for me and for you. Uh, but I want to go to another level. I want to go, I want the whole church to go to another level. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where those abound, my constant aim is higher ground. There's always higher ground. And God's got higher ground for every one of us. Only be brave and very courageous, for God's got a land for you to take. Amen. Amen. Amen.